Hello, everyone. I have a new encouraging word for the day for all of you. It comes from Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Romans 6, 23 tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is one of the beautiful things about Scripture. God's word is eternal truth, and it stands bold and true for every person that has ever lived on this earth and studied its contents. God has told us here in our encouraging word for the day, that the payment for sin is death. But he tells us in that same verse that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Have you ever heard the term doublespeak? I'm sure that many of you have. Doublespeak is a form of language that deliberately distorts, disguises, or even reverses the meaning of words and phrases to deceive or mislead people. Let me give you a few examples of doublespeak and how it works. Uh, one would be if a person's trying to sell a car and they, they want to sell it, they really want you to come look at it and check it out. And so they're going to say something like, it's slightly used. But in reality, what that really means or what's really the truth is that it's 10 years old. See, they say it's slightly used, but it's actually 10 years old, which implies it's a lot of used. But people don't sell things that way. And so they have to change the language or they're compelled to change the language to bring in potential buyers. Anytime a company needs to fire some of their employees, what do they call it? Downsizing or trimming the fat. Uh, and, and those, again, those are phrases when the employees find out that people are getting fired, they say, wait, what's happening? Am I going to lose my job? No, we're just downsizing. We're just trimming the fat. And they leave it to you to figure out who the fat is. Another interesting word or term that is used as doublespeak is friendly fire. Isn't that interesting? When someone is hit by a bullet or a bomb that was fired by their own countrymen, it's called friendly fire. Like, sorry you're dead, but it was friendly. If a country orders a bombing raid on its enemy, they will quickly go out and tell the press that they are are offering air support. Doesn't that sound nice? We're offering air support. No, you're actually bombing people. And that's the reality of it. These days, doublespeak is everywhere. And I mean everywhere. Everywhere. Everything is being changed by language to either misidentify or just confuse the individual who's hearing this information. But doublespeak is especially being used in regard to sin or sinful behavior. The world has done all that it can to mask the ugliness of sin and ultimately to parade it. People use phrases like pro-choice, life partner. We've replaced the word addiction with disease. Doublespeak is everywhere in politics, and if you're anywhere over the age of 10 years old, you know that's true. Doublespeak is the way politicians speak all the time. Here's how George Orwell described political speech in his book, 1984. In our time, political speech is largely the defense of the indefensible. The great enemy of clear language is insincerity. When there's a gap between one's real aim and one's declared aim, that one will instinctively turn to long words and exhausted idioms. And that's exactly right. When someone's avoiding the reality of what's happening or the true answer or the fact that they're accountable for what they've done or what they've said, they will instinctively turn to long words and exhausted idioms. I love the way he explains it because he says it is largely the defense of the indefensible. People want to hear the truth so they can know what they should feel and how to think about things. And politicians are the best at covering up what's really happening and trying their best to make it look like it's really the best thing that's ever happened to you. You're welcome. Isaiah pronounces a series of woes on all those who use this tactic. In Isaiah chapter 5, he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from a righteous man. It's very clear here. Woe to anyone who switches evil for good and good for evil, who who begins to call the things which are right and upright and take courage to do and to get done, they say that's evil. They don't have any feelings you know, towards the other person or they're, they're negatively impacting people by saying those things or teaching what God's word says. And so they trade light, which is God's truth, for darkness. And they disguise it under 
what they would call a blatant attack or an aggressive attack against those who are weaker or those who can't defend themselves. And it is simply not true. At least it shouldn't be. It absolutely shouldn't be. Woe to those who justify the wicked for a bribe. You give me money, I'll make this all go away. And I can do it with double speak. I want to give you one of the biggest words that I can think of that we try to cover in all sorts of ways because of the ugliness of it and what it ultimately means for us. The word is death. And the reason why is because death causes a lot of fear and anxiety in human beings. The Bible tells us that the fear of death puts us in bondage. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, the Hebrew writer, he's speaking of Jesus. He says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Christ came in the flesh and suffered death on the cross, and he has overcome that death through the resurrection, and he has defeated the devil who had the power over death. I mean, this is huge, what God has done for us, because we were living in fear of death throughout all of our lifetime, and the Bible tells us that we're in bondage because of it. Christ has made us free, and that is something worth talking about and worth teaching, not changing the words, not disguising anything, but saying it for exactly for what it is so that those can respond and be saved from their sin. The fear of death keeps us in bondage, and it causes us to be fearful and anxious all the time. No one understands this better than doctors, nurses, hospitals, or hospice care workers. And so these institutions soften the language or change it all together to avoid that terrible D word. There is a thing called the Double Speak Award. Uh, it's an ironic tribute to public speakers who have perpetuated language that is grossly deceptive, evasive, euphemistic, or confusing. It's been issued by the National Council of Teachers of English since 1974. I'm going to give you a couple that concern the word death. In 2008, a hospital in California made the list for the double speak they used for the word death. They called it negative patient care outcome. Negative patient care outcome means that the patient has died. A hospital in Philadelphia tried the same thing and they used this. When someone died in the hospital, they called it a diagnostic misadventure of high magnitude. <laughs> Imagine someone coming into the hospital and saying, is my husband dead or is my wife dead or is my child going to be okay? And the hospital in Philadelphia says, actually, it's a diagnostic misadventure of high magnitude. And can you imagine the person who wants to know the answer to the question? They would say, what are you talking about? Just answer the question. But again, it softens that terrible blow that the person who has the information is afraid to share because they know what that's going to do to that person. Instinctively, we, we know like, oh, this isn't going to be good. And so we want to change what's actually happened. We want to soften that the best way that we can. I think all of us have done that to one extent or another, not to harm anyone, but just because we know that the information is too much to bear. And so these places, hospitals and hospi hospice care facilities, have gone to great lengths to disguise that. Our word is encouraging today because doublespeak will not stop death. Because God has told us clearly that the payment for sin is death. And can I say to all of you that that is why this is encouraging? It's encouraging to have the Bible in our hands, to be able to read it and understand what it says. First of all, it's directly from God. Secondly, it's entirely true. And it convicts us of the sin that we've committed. And it shows us how to be freed from it. And, and, and not just freed from the sin that we're engaged in, but its terrible end. The outcome, which God, that's his greatest concern. Not that we would die, but that we would die in our sins. Jesus says in John 8 and verse 24, If you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. He wants us to believe in him. He wants us to trust him. And so the Bible doesn't change it. Romans 6 and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life 
in Christ Jesus our Lord.